welcome back. Let's continue with the second lesson in the of Bhagavad Okay. So, we have now just learned in the last lecture what the stabilization of the value is with respect to the end of the Our end of was suspension. Uh, it would probably be a good idea to. Well, no. We can <laughs> indulge into much more uh, consideration about the topological case there, the cosmology of logical spaces. But, I mean, eventually we want to come to motivic stuff, and half the course is over by now. So, maybe it's a good time to go to sleep. Uh, this would be part six. Let's just a small interlude. So, may, may I ask who knows what a scheme is in this room? Many people. That's really a high concentration. Absolutely. Wow. Great. And who knows what a sheaf is for uh, on a topological space, let's say. Uh, uh -huh. And who knows what a sheaf for a growth in topology is. Okay. Not so bad. Uh -huh. Not so bad. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, so here's a quick introduction, which possibly, uh, hopefully, is enough to follow the rest. I mean. But actually, it's the point of these lectures that we don't need to know what it is for, for certain parts of uh, the complex theory. <laughs> so remember uh, our, our next album that we had for cohomology theories of topological spaces. So now we want to do something similar for schemes. The technicalities will be uh, addressed a bit. So cohomology theories well, to some kind of abelian category, possibly greatest of being groups. And there will be a similar axiom. So yeah, uh, that's that's the idea of the Gomtuk theory and I mean why this is a good idea is <laughs> It's a long story. <laughs> they solved big conjectures and had lots of applications. So uh, let's begin with, with what the series. is. So the, uh, maybe I won't define it entirely, but uh, the shortest non-complete <laughs> definition of scheme, probably the following scheme. So we need a base uh, ring or base Scheme more generally, but let's say green. And then a scheme is a certain kind of functor, according to some people, maybe not the <laughs> 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 from R algebra to sets. because we can model geometric forms by these things. Let's uh, find a scheme called circle. We'll send well, uh, an R algebra A 
to the set of all x y such that x squared plus y squared equals one. That's a subset of a squared, capital A right. squared. A. <laughs> so the set of tuples. Why is this a functor? Because we have a homomorphism of R algebras for the function f that sends just x, y to f of x, f of y, and because homomorphisms of R algebras preserve plus and times, this equation will still be satisfied. Okay, um, well, here's a simpler one. <coughs> That's an example. The affine line is an example that we need, A1. What is that? That's just sending an, a, an R algebra A to itself. It's underlying set. I forget about the algebra structure. Or sometimes we don't, but. <laughs> um, here's another one that's GM. Being very economic here, all of these schemes will occur, or this will not occur. <laughs> this uh, sends an R algebra A to a set of units. So this is representable. But actually, mm -hmm. I should maybe uh, make clear all these are all representable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is. The set of R algebra homomorphisms from uh, R X Y mod Y I feel generic for this to A. Now because how, how can I define an R algebra homomorphism like this? I pick images of X and of Y and then the whole homomorphism is uh, determined by this because there's an R algebra homomorphism. And I only get such an homomorphism if in A this relation. So this, this here is uh, also be written just like that. Other words like this can be given by just picking an image of X. And I have a many possibilities for that. Um, how about the units? Well, I. This is a bijection to the pairs such that x times y equals 1. Of course, well, if I have such a pair, then the y is weakly current by the x, and so in reality, I will only talk about units, and then the inverse is. And that would be homomorphous from R algebras to. Uh, I was from so you see how, how the defining equations can be just codified in here. So I said there needs to be a good kind of representables. Well, the identity is a good kind. These are all representables so far. <laughs> I really like in that approach to, to schemes that you see in which sense a scheme is actually a, a scheme. Yeah? A scheme is a scheme in the, in the everyday sense which associates to any ring a set of solutions of something in that ring. That's a yeah. schema. Yeah? Presses the ring into a scheme. <laughs> yeah. Then you can draw out what, what comes out in the, in the case of the ring. The ring is maybe a color and the scheme is like a, something where you pass your uh, okay, so um, those were simple. Also, this business with the risky sheet doesn't really come up. Those, all of those, all of the representable functors are the risky sheets, whatever that may mean. Now let's have an example where it does come up. Uh, and I call it. AM is not zero. <coughs> I have seen people cringe when they gave that name, but. Uh, no, it's good. 
I think so too. What's wrong with it? I don't know. You don't even know how to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to uh, send an R algebra A to the set of n tuples such that one of these is a unit plus for clear. But this is not a Zariski sheet, and I'll tell you why, I don't know what that means. So we have to Zariski sheet if I then it becomes a scheme. Yes. So why unit and not non zero? Well, exactly. That's why people cringe when I say this. But over the <laughs> field, it's the same. And you somehow always take the field intuition to, to think um, about schemes. But so you can see there's a family, you know, I don't know. Uh, but will, will I actually get a and minus zero? Over a few, yes, of course. No, over any, over general ring R? No. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> In the, if you switch to the... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah then it's true. Yeah. So general, <laughs> general schemes over, over non-fields, you can you often see them as, as families over, over well, yeah. Of little schemes which are the fibers of a family of fields which are the residue fields of the points of the base. And then that's what it is fiber wise. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what does this uh, service classification mean? But what scheme will you get actually? That is a scheme. <laughs> no, what scheme will you, I mean, <laughs> what uh, scheme in the other sense will you get over another? In the rate? other sense? Yes. Okay. Well, just wait, uh, I'm going to explain this one. <laughs> it's important for the lectures. Very old fashioned yes. comments are being made here. Okay. Scheme is a local root space. <laughs> At least say local so that it works constructively. So, yeah. What does this little suffix mean here? Zar uh, means the risk of justification, and that should be the following. Um, so, what that, does that mean? I change my functor that I have defined here uh, in such a way that I can check the condition for a to be in here. Uh, on each of the, of the members of the covering. <coughs> and that means the following. plus and minus one available. So this would be the, the pairs such that one of them is plus or minus one. Mm -hmm. But, well, I don't want to equal actually here. I claim that in this year, the pair of three, comma five is also it. there. Yes. Why? Because I have a covering of that. So this the covering means the following. Mm -hmm. I localize it each, well, I should maybe rather like this, uh, three and five. So what is covering? It's a, it's a bunch of localizations of this ring, uh, such that the prime regions where I localize together generate the whole ring. Yeah. 
Yeah, here, here we have, of course, <coughs> the three and five, okay, everything possibly five are co-prime. And now I'm allowed to check, well, for this tuple 3, 5 to be in, in this, the risk justification, I'm allowed to check it at each of this, uh, these localizations. So, yeah, in, in Z3, 3 is the unit, so 3, 5 would be in there, and Z5, 5 is the unit, so this. So this uh, qualifies. It's a complete covering already, and now we can. But I think, wait, wait, you wait. Don't, I think you're not meaning Z index 3, yeah. but Z localization away from what? Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, that one. Yes. Yeah. What's the right one? Yeah. Me? Hmm? Z index bracket 3 means this. No, no. no, no. Uh, yeah, well, it's exactly I also know the notation, but. Oh, yeah, it's complementary. Yeah. No? Yeah, yeah it's a complement, yeah. Yeah, if you put a prime ideal in the index, it means you formally yeah, yeah. invert all the elements which are not in that prime ideal. Uh, yes, okay, so you, look, so you find this cover. The cover, and, they, and if I check this tuple 3,5, then uh, in each of these covering things, I can see that one of them is a unit. And so it belongs to this set a squared with a zero of z. That's what changes by the justification. So you add more sections. Yeah, so yeah. you add more sections in some sense. Yeah. I mean, a priori, you might also identify some sections yes. which were there before, but not in that particular example. Yeah. Because that already happened to be a separated free sheet. Yeah, very more things can happen upon this justification, but so that's it. So now you know roughly at least what the risky sheet is. <laughs> Something which is defined by a condition, and this condition I am allowed to check locally. It's a risky local. Okay, maybe we should ask: Is is somebody still confused by the Z three versus Z over three issue we talked about? Okay. <laughs> okay, since it doesn't take so long, I can just give a also a, like a hit, or maybe a complete uh, vision of the second condition that there should be a good covering. Well, if I have it says that we need a, such a such a Functor to be a, a risky sheaf and to admit a good covering by representables. And that means the following. So if I have a functor, and have another. I don't have a square of functors, but... Uh, you have a collection of open subfunctors. That's right, but uh, how do you write it? <laughs> yeah, I guess, I, well, I have to write a square of natural transformation, so... So I need my, now I'm, I'm uh, drawing square the category of functors. Well, let's set to the R prime. You want the following, you want a bunch of second functors. Yes. And such that whenever I take a pullback along some other representable functor, what comes out here is again representable. Uh, 
and well, uh, you know what the mega lemma that the transformation to the central functors are given by um, by max between the representing objects, mm -hmm. and this one should come from the localization. Locally, because P is only asked to be an epimorphism <coughs> in the toppers of the risky sheaves, not pre sheaves. Yeah. yeah. Now it was <laughs> better to get. But okay. Uh, I mean, if people are interested, we can give more details in the exercise lesson. Yeah. The idea is uh, simply that uh, the risky sheaf, which is not yet, uh, which does not yet satisfy that covering condition, this is something like a space. Yeah, it's local. It's good, it's good space, but it's not yet of interest of, to algebraic geometry because it's not locally affine. It's not doesn't have anything to do with with ring theory. And now we cut down to those spaces to to those functors which are in some sense locally affine, and then we are into the business of algebraic geometry. Now. And all of the technical details get vastly simplified if we uh, have the courage to use the internal language of the big risky toppers, um, in which those functors look uh, like plain old sets, and in which morphism between functors look like plain old maps between those sets. We can also talk about that in the exercise lessons. Absolutely, that's a very good topic. And then an open subfunctor is simply what you think it is, namely a subset given by inequalities. But we'll learn that if you want. So maybe you should say something about the well, relative field sentence. <laughs> Where this locally uh, demands some for the So there's a general philosophy that I have some category I embed it into its pre shapes or maybe into sheaves for some topology. And uh, these pre sheaves or sheaves should be thought of as glued together from the base cat, from the original category. And so such an F might not be representable, but it's covered by representables. And any time I have uh, a map between two sheaves, I can define some property for it by reducing back to the representables. And that's what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, that is why algebra geometry is locally commutative algebra. Yeah. But I know, I mean, if you're used to some other kind of algebraic geometry, I mean, usually people say soothingly, now just think of varieties, and <coughs> I'm horrified then, but <laughs> because I don't really know what a variety is. <laughs> but if, if you know varieties, then just take that, it's fine. It's a reduced, separated scheme of finite type of a field. Well, that's what I always thought, but you told me that the category of reduced separated schemes of finite type is equivalent to that variety. Yeah, now yeah. I'm yeah. Lost. I don't know what yeah. the other side. Yeah. <laughs> so let's at least check that this um, A2 without zero, this scheme that we just defined, uh, has such a covering. Two without zero in 
be written like this. So we have uh, two possibilities of being in A2 without zero. Either we have uh, a unit in the first place and something else in the second. So this would be a lot of the whole ring, whatever. So first unit, all the other way around. So that's covering. And the dissection of this, these two possibilities, or well, that's if you have two units. So you could as well define this as push out, but it's push out in schemes. Yes. <laughs> Which yes. means something else than push out as pointers. Yes, very important. So, yeah, so we could. The push out in, in pre sheets or push out just in funters would be exactly what I first wrote, and then without the Zariski, right. we will subscript. Then after sheet defining, this obtains more elements, like, for example, this 3, 4. Yeah. Without the shification, um, that H2 without the zero would be a very weird kind of space because um, any map into it would factor completely over one of those open subfunctors. And this is, yeah, this violates your geometric intuition, right? You could think that, uh, that a map does not need to fit into one of those open subparts. It might touch all of the space. Okay. Should I talk some more about the sheaf condition? Well, there, I mean, lots of people said that they know what sheaves are. Uh, so if I have Can you write JK instead of IJ at that at that index? No, there to the right. Okay, yes. Yeah. I think that is just an extremely tiny detail, but it the helps right, in. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, given such a such an object and such covering. Now we can take two maps from that covering and well, now, now maybe it's rather a case of J and K. And then take a full back. Let's put this little C. And evaluate F at this and this and this, we get maps which restrict uh, around different maps, right? And what we want, well, this is a sheet if that diagram is an equalizer. I mean, the equalizer means for every test sheet that comes to here, such that the, these two compositions are equal, there's a unique map. And this uh, the vision behind this is just that. I mean, think of the sheaf of continuous functions in a topological space. 
and think of, of a bunch of open subsets, some X. Well, that's, this would be continuous functions on these open subsets. That these two things coincide means exactly that they coincide on the intersections. And then this, this collection defines a function of the whole space. That's the, well, the intuition behind the notion of sheep. But you can do this by just axiomatically giving yourself the notion of covering. Now you can just declare a bunch of families to be coverings and then say, okay, something is achieved for this notion of covering. This is what we do in the case of the risk and in many other cases. That morphism has to be in the other way around, that unique morphism. Oh, yeah. Really? Depending on your vigilance. But is that true? No, that's not true. Uh, uh, ah, well, okay, right. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm stupid. They're used to it coming from below. Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all right, sorry. So did you say yet that the fiber product should be thought of as an intersection? Uh, yes. I'll have to say it again. I mean, in the case of open subsets of a topological space X, with UI, with UJ, UK, then this pullback would be the intersection. And so, yeah, maybe this is actually a really unnecessary preparation for the, for the scheme setting of multi-compute theory. Um, <coughs> so if we have this notion of sheaf, we can, can form the category of sheaves. It's a, it's a subcategory. Uh, um, so, so, as I said, we can make sense of this notion of sheaf for, for any collection of coverings. Such a collection is called multi topology. Well, actually, multi topology satisfies a few more um, axioms, but these are exactly the axioms that, that don't change the notion of sheep. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, you can pull back coverings along some map, and then you get a new covering. That's, that's a one closure operation that you apply to get a good topology. And, uh, yeah, such so Let's just, we only have good notions of coverings here. This is a quantity topology. So this is a collection of Covering sets. Some nice. And this gives us a category of sheaves. Sheaves on our, on our category C where these maps live. Things you can always, if you have some functor, you can sheetify it, you can force it to be a sheet. That's a, for the seclusion functor has a left joint, which, given a, given a functor like this, produces the closest sheet to it. That's sheetification. And then just, however this may work in, in, in detail, I'll just give the a nice property of this. Because that's probably what will play more of a role. So, who knows the inverse property of the Unida and Becky? Which one? Yeah. Ah, which one? Which, uh, yeah, right. So you got the co-completion thing. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's a man. 
Okay, so what is this? We have a category C, we can map it to the contravariant functors on C by just sending an object to the functor it represents. Sorry, it represents like this. To the contravariant. That's the unit I'm adding. And this is, so C should be a small category for this. Well, it has the following real property for any other co complete category D, then functor F, there's a unique co limit preserving continuation of F to this whole thing. All like this. Yeah, so you could say that uh, we have some little category here, and whenever we map to a coherent category, we we can continue it through this whole huge thing. Also, well, it's a fact that every, as uh, Alexander already said, that every punter like this is. Uh, the colon of representative functors. Yeah, just a little bit why this works. Um, I mean, if you have if you have any. <coughs> C to, to sets. Well, the Unida lemma tells us natural transformations from representable functors with this G are the same as G and C. Same the specific natural transformation, which is an isomorphism. And so this tells you that. I'm just being uh, sketchy here. So G is determined of course by what it does the object on the maps. And thus it is determined by, by all the natural transformations from representative functors. Following is true, so we can take the diagram of all representable functors mapping to G. Then yeah, the, uh, the objects in here would be functors of this kind and map to G. Mm -hmm. Morphism would be triangles. Uh, then we can forget about the master G. I don't know how to call this. The name. Uh, no. Well, we just from this we get a huge diagram. So we have the functors, and each one occurs once for every element of GC because the elements correspond to maps. But all of this. Well, now we have a diagram over here, We're taking the colon we get back G. And that's how you define the yeah. F. Every G in here is a colon of representables, and so if I know where to send the representables in my D, and I want this to be colon preserving, then I just express G as colon with representables. And 
take the column in here. Right? Set the representables where they belong, and then put, take the column in here. And this sort of defines this whole thing. Do you want to write? Uh, do you want to write down the the Cohen formula again for the F bar for fun? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I think it goes like this: um, F F bar of um, of G, I think, yeah, pre sheaf right. uh, equals the integral overall. Then in the upper index C element capital C. Of um, uh, um, G of C times F of C. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's true. It looks reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In case you're wondering, uh, there's a beautiful paper called um, This is the co and my only co-friend, by... Um, right. And in that paper you can learn everything there is to know about the co and calculus. Okay. It, so, it totally increases the quality of your life, knowing that. Okay, so um, what we know from this is that uh, given a small category, we have a, a co-completion. Yeah, so uh, something the universal funded to a co-complete category, the initial funded to a co-complete category, and that's the pre sheets Now, how does this how does this work? You can think of this as just creating co-limits of all kinds of diagrams that you might imagine, not just in here, this little C, but in some bigger ambient, and then uh, yeah, making category out of those. Okay, but so it creates all kinds of co-limits that that you need to be co-complete, but it disregards co-limits that might already exist here and that you well, possibly at least. I think always. Always. Yes. 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 Possibly always. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, it must, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a free co-completion. It does not preserve any... Well, not any kind of... Well, thing. any, I mean, it preserves absolute ones. Yes, absolutely, exactly. Yeah. But I think other than that, it doesn't preserve any. Yeah, it can't. Okay. So it's just all the columns that already exist in C, but sometimes we want to keep those. And that's, that's what justification does for you. So I want to talk about this universal positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Well, suppose we have the following uh, gluing of, of, of a variety or of, of a theme or a manifold. Now we have we have some some push out diagram like this. Glue a geometric object by by some opens. Now we you need to embed this. Now that's exactly the geometric kind of thing that we want to have. Uh, well, that has geometric meaning. We, we still want to, to have it preferably a few more after embedding here. And so, question is: Is then the unida of all of this push out and see? We can can. Start checking and then see where it goes wrong and then rectify this, and this will be the justification. Well, to check this, we need to get ourselves a test sheet, uh, well, test pre sheet, and two maps from here, from here and there. And see whether which coincide when it's recomposed, and see whether we have a unique such map. So what would this mean? It means by 
when you need element, give him uh, elements g of b and a g of c. And that's the same as maps from here, right here. Which coincide on on this here. Okay, so you know it's time for names. <coughs> so I and J. This is still I and J. Yeah, yeah, let's write it first this. Uh, I of I upper star of Y is J is not X. And the question is, is there an element of this D here which restricts to these both? Why is your I have a star injected? Oh, well, it comes. I was thinking of gluing a uh, straight, it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I doubt it is in general. Right. Well, it depends on. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be. I was just being suggested. Yeah. Okay, the question is then, uh, is there uh, some z in the g of d such that the restriction maps are this here? Okay, uh, k and l such that k of z is x. Yes. Okay, so. Um, can phrase it differently. This the situation here, giving x and y and dc. Give me something to draw out here. Put that these two things are straight for the same. And the question is, is there you need something in G of T? So in the category of sheaves, if we just restrict to sheaves for which this thing is really a, a covering, then this will remain a push out in the, in the category. And this gives us another universal property. Chosen push out of those chosen coverings to 
coverings here, meaning all. Let's stay in push outs. If these push outs are mapped to push outs again by F, then it's the right C between these shapes. Yes. Uh, doesn't this mean that representative prefunctors uh, automatically sheep? No. It could happen that under the sheepification, the representative prefunctor no longer is presented. But I mean, in all reasonable cases, they are. But I mean, sheaves are exactly those functors from whose point of view mm -hmm. is still a push out. So if we have uh, g equal to y of an object, then wouldn't we just get back the original push out condition by the unit dilemma? I don't think I understand. I mean, I mean, nothing, nothing uh, tells us that this functor f, the some concrete category, will uh, map our give push out here to a push out again. Right? This could just not be the case for some push out square. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't see the reason why you think it might be. In practice, it is. I would have trouble coming up with a non canonical golden topology, as you call them. But <laughs> the page topology is, is not canonical. I see, okay. What? There are examples, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> like the trivial topology. But I mean, ah, by age topology is, of course, natural, that's true. Yeah. Well, maybe we uh, discuss this then later. I, I don't know quite see the reason early. It's an exercise so that um, if C happens to contain an initial object, but then the UNIDA embedding does not preserve that initial object. Never. Just to stress that the UNIDA embedding typically fails to preserve colonies. The original unit embedding not post composed with the. Well, never was not true. I think never. No, I mean, take yeah. some small category of sets and take the empty set, it's the initial object in there. You will have no maps into the empty set, the pre sheaves, so the outcome will be empty, the empty set of morphisms. Um, so no, 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 right. no. Except for the empty set. Yes, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, this, mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Ah, yeah. ah, because there's the empty function. Yeah, sure, there's the empty. Ah, okay. yeah. Recall that we are not scared of special cases. Yes. And especially not of empty cases. Yes. But it does preserve all limits. Yeah, yeah, it preserves all limits, yeah. yeah. So what, what is the joint? Okay, so in uh, seven minutes there will be an evasion of logicians in here. So before that, Maybe this was a little bit dry and uh, not clear to what purpose I, I uh, amassed these facts. So let's end with an outlook and then I will tell you I will tell you what, what this whole stuff is. So what we want is motility complex theory for schemes or varieties if you prefer. So we look at cohomology theories for schemes. Actually They have to be smooth schemes, which you typically take. No singularities, that means. And they go to some abelian category, typically. I don't write just um, abelian sequences of abelian groups. Of course, I mean, there is typically a bi grading, it's not just sequences, and also they can have, have more structure and not just be abelian groups. Now, so here's a step that wasn't visible for topological spaces. 
So our target category is co-complete. So we can factor through the co-completion. And these, these uh, invariants, they typically satisfy some kind of descent. That means you can determine the value on a scheme by restricting to some covering of this scheme for uh, smaller things. And so you can translate this as saying, yeah, that, uh, that certain pushouts are, are preserved. And that's why it factors for sheaves, actually. <coughs> so let's... Yeah, I mean, this is a big first step to take. And this thing is really called just SM over K. So we go here, we go to the co-completion, and usually you would say it's, it's uh, set-valued functors, while well, in our uh, field ticket we're setting space-valued functors. So we take this, uh, this, and that has the same property They set by spaces, now the field category where we take the political spaces and to divert equivalences. Then we have the same universal property in infinity category. Okay, so we go to something co complete, we can first go here. Then we uh, want to simplify because certain coverings will remain coverings and will somehow allow to to compute things more locally, those invariants that we are looking at. So you could take the risky, uh, really what we do take is mismanaged topology, whatever that might be. Let's not go into it now. Then it's, next, it's true that um, on smooth schemes, these invariants that we look at, and I'm thinking about algebraic K theory and uh, etal cohomology, Christian cohomology, and these are <laughs> invariant, homotopy invariant in the sense not that I can contract the unit interval, but the fine line. So I can invert these in the field category sense. And that's why we have to go to go to, through all this trouble that we went to, to now. And this is called utility spaces. Well then. I already have a question. <laughs> yes? Why do we start with smooth over Because K? And the, the, K the, standard, the standard invariants like the cohomology or algebraic K theory, they are not a one invariant for non smooth schemes. Ah. Mm -hmm. ah. And, and, and uh, is K algebraic No. And does K have to be a field? No. Can be basically nice. Ah, okay. Well, it may be right. So. Usually, no. Yeah. no. Usually, uh, there are some very general conditions there. Okay, that's just a theory. Basically, theory. No, but uh, geometrically uni branch is kind of thing to word or whatever it may mean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It depends on what you want to do. I mean, uh, in the end, I want to at least state the fact that only holds over fields, and that's wonderful. You can compute the, uh, the stable optimal groups of the motivic sphere spectrum over a field, and that has to do with quadratic forms, and that's really great. Right. Okay, but just to complete this picture here and then stop. Uh, of course, our events go to a point category because there's a zero abelian group here, so we can have base point. <laughs> then, uh, there are functors, endofunctors, this would explain. So one thing is we have suspension. As I told you, it's just sigma x is the co-limit of x to the point to the point. Something that makes sense in any infinity category. This gives an endofunctor. The other end of functor. It makes sense, but need not exist, right? Need not exist. But yeah. we first thing we did was co-complete, and yeah. then okay. we are mm -hmm. safe. Also, this localization is within presentable categories and still okay. co-complete. 
So this is really smashing with S1. As we noticed once before, we can say it again next time. Then also we have the end function of smashing with GM. The, the scheme of units lives here and can be imported all the way. Actually, as a pointed scheme, you're pointed by, by the one unit. It's not exactly important. And these two we invert. same happens as, as in topology. Cohomology theories for schemes become representable here by motivic spectra. That are sequences of motivic spaces. And for example, in here, I mean there's the so-called motivic under plane spectrum. represents motivic homology, whatever that may be. And you can do the same thing and smash with this, that's a free functor going to change the modules. Something we can make sense of. And that's what is called motives. And then what well, if we start here with uh, motivic homology, we can go all the way. So now why do we avoid uh, smashing with GM? We will give some motivation for that. We'll just start again next time with this hexagon and then schemes and different variants in this set. Okay, we should start. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, so <laughs> the yoga modus was uh, conceived that there is some universal motivic homology theory, and the other ones are somehow specialization, right? So, how in the end, how do I get the tal homology and much structure? And things like that? Well, it's something that factors through here. Yeah. Well, how do you get it? I mean, they're represented by motivic spectra. They are just special cases of all this. I don't think. Okay. But they'll they'll appear as certain spectra in the. It's uh, yes, they have yeah. percent Okay. And you just said that homology, the top homology in this stuff is not invariant under A1 uh, on top of the if uh, you don't have a smooth scheme. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, but still the question is why, why do we, why do we go this way instead of, yeah, well, where else would you go? <laughs> well, you could just compute it strictly. Just strictly. Yeah, you could. Sure, everybody would like that, but it's not so easy. Yeah. Uh, this whole, I mean, this uh, A1 uh, <coughs> contraction really makes life easier in many, many yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. respects. It's also it's not true that uh, you, are, you lost all the non-smooth schemes. They still live here. Because yes. non-smooth schemes are, are functors from yeah. smooth schemes to sets. Yeah. They right? can still be probed by smooth schemes. Absolutely. And so what you get then, if you if you apply your homology theories to, to non-smooth schemes as they live here, yeah. uh, are the uh, like the close well uh, they are new invariants, but they are the closest A1 invariant functor to the original functor. So if I have it, there's there's Weibel's uh, homotopy K theory in H it's called, and that's what you get if you take uh, algebraic K theory and force it to be in one A1 invariant. Mm -hmm. That's something that. But would, would you say that it is a, a more correct invariant, or that it's just a way to compute the original? No, it's not more correct. I mean, the other ones are more correct, but you have to somehow deal with okay. them. And for smooth games, this is how it works, and for non smooth, you still can say stuff. I mean. and, and does this include like the Lean's, the Lean's mixed hash, the mixed hash theory? Well, yeah. There is a. In principle, yes, it's here. 
Well, there is a bit of a subtlety between yeah, absolute invariance and relative invariance. So, so this, you know, these Hodge, Hodge structures or Galois representations or so on that you have in the tile cohomology, they appear by first going to the by closure of the base field, the other field, and then applying your stuff, and then you have a, a Galois operation. So they are a bit, but you can do that. I mean, there uh, it's a bit there's a base change involved, and then you land here in a category which is a bit, but for example, it's color representations or watch structures and so on. So it has a bit of a where you want to go. More questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so there's this technical difficulty, like that if you localize your um, the A1 invariance and then she applies for the A1 invariance anymore and vice versa. How is this in this picture or the first? No, I just you know I just take the subcategory of space to the smooth K op, which consists of the risk species which are also a one invariant. Uh, I mean that you have such a localization functor, of course, and in practice you sometimes have this infinite uh, alteration process. But yeah, it's some subcategory we have functor here, that's all I I said so far. Okay, then let's thank Peter again.